this is your host Henry Hyde and we're here today for Battle Chat number 13. Can you believe it? I've been cranking out a lot of podcasts lately but having fun doing it. And today I'm absolutely delighted that at short notice actually, I have been able to drag uh, onto today's podcast none other than the brainy half of Two Fat Lardies. He's putting his thumbs up to that. Mr. Nick Skinner. Well, welcome to you, Nick. Hello, Henry. (laughs) I didn't know it was number 13. I don't know if I would have agreed that if I'd known it was number 13. Ah, yes, it's lucky 13. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. On the continent, apparently, number 13 is lucky. It's only kind of uh, Anglo-centric countries that uh, 13 is unlucky. So we're going to count it. We'll pretend to be French today. And and we will say it's a lucky number 13. Um, So obviously, yes, everyone out there, you will certainly uh, know Nick as half of the two fat lardies pairing. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Rich Clark can't be with us today because he is otherwise occupied or has been uh, fighting a huge war game up with uh, retired now Major General John Dravinkovitz and his various other um, uh, disreputables or whatever he calls him. I can't remember what they were, the, the occasionals yeah. or whatever they're called, yeah. uh, up in Suffolk. Uh, so he's kind of driving at full speed back down, but he's, uh, he's not going to make it to the podcast today. So I've got Nick all to myself. You have. So what would you like to know about Richard's? <laughs> All all bets are off. (laughs) He will be driving at the speed of light, of course, because that's the only speed he's got on the Lard Mobile. (laughs) I can tell you that from my own experience. Is he as tall as he looks on the telly? (laughs) No, not at all. He's only three foot six, really. We make him stand on a box for everything we do. (laughs) And stand on an empty beer crate now in him. But anyway. Yeah. Nick, it's really great to have you on board, and here we are uh, yakking away on Skype um, with the, nice mar- to talk to you, the, the marvels of modern technology, which is something we're going to be talking about a bit later in the show, because uh, it's one of the things that's prompted me to get in touch with you. But for those people who, you know, they might know a bit, you know, obviously they know your name through Two Fat Lardies, they may even have bumped into you at a show, they might have heard you on the old cast that you're doing now with uh, Rich and Sid, Sydney Roundwood. Um, but For those who might not know, can you tell people a little bit about your journey and how you came to get into wargaming as a hobby and came to get involved in wargaming as a business, in fact? Uh, Right, Okay. well, we can go a long way back if you want to, Henry. Do you want to go back to boyhood? The Doomsday Book, as far as you know. Yeah, Okay. well, I I had um, my introduction to wargaming, I guess, came through my big brother. I had two big brothers. Uh, and they, my biggest brother was nine years older than me. So when I was a, uh, an irritating little chap, instead of an irritating big chap, um, <laughs> I, I was following him around and learning stuff from him. And he was into Airfix and Tamiya and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So this was in the, uh, I've just turned 50, so this was in the, in the early 70s. Right. And I guess my first memory was sitting down with him painting 132nd scale Airfix Japanese uh, by the gas fire, All right. and then wondering while well, the paint had peeled off the next day. You know, that that, <laughs> that kind of experience. Yeah. Um, and we used to play with those soldiers. And when he was out, as he got bigger, because obviously he used to discard things and they'd come down to me, uh, sometimes they would come down the official route, and sometimes they'd arrive the unofficial route, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, when he was out. And I'd say, oh, I fancy having to go with that armoured car. So we'd be playing with that. Um and I guess that turned into an obsession with me for World War Two. So all the remember all the Parnell illustrated histories of the war and that kind of thing. Oh God, yeah, yeah. We used to have all of those, and I could tell you everything there was to know about Sten guns, Bren guns, Bismarck, Spitfires, yeah. um, all the various marks of aircraft that flew for the French Air Force in the Second World War, all that kind of stuff. I was really hot on. Um, and at every opportunity we'd get those soldiers out and play games with my friends. But it was, soon became obvious that I was actually more into it than they were. Right. Um, and I guess by the time I got to uh, senior school, that had grown into something that I understood to be wargaming, whatever that was, yeah. uh, driven by the books that are in the school library. Gotcha. And there weren't really very many books in the school library. Mm-hmm. And as we've discussed before, one of those books in particular, The War Game, yeah. uh, edited by Charles Grant, was actually almost permanently in my in my uh, in my bag 
Yeah, we should point out to listeners that it's not the war game by Charles Grant with with the Spencer Smith soldiers on the front. No, it's not. It's uh, the war game. Actually, I think it was edited, wasn't it, by uh, Peter Young? Edited uh, it could it. be, yeah. I could have got yeah, that wrong. It's, a, it's the bigger there. format book with all the – it had all the different – battles in like saratoga and uh i can't remember all the list of oh, gosh, yeah. well it starts it starts back in ancient greek with the thermopylae and then it goes yeah, right the way through to saratoga it's got lobazits in there waterloo yeah. gettysburg blenheim Agincourt. Exactly. a chapter on each one and each one is supported by some fantastic photos that are you know inspiring stuff for their time yeah. the greatest sort of photos you could see as a kid really yeah, yeah. and that got me into the idea of wargaming and um, I'm not quite sure when Miniature War Games first started as a magazine, but 1983. Um, yeah, so that was that was that would coincide bang on with me getting into war gaming. And there was a guy who used to write in there because I used to live in St Albans, right. and there was a guy who wrote in there for the very early editions. I think his surname was Gosling, and I think oh, I think yes. his mum, I think his mum was a teacher at my school, oh, and he used to talk about St Albans War Games Club which used to meet at a road actually just around the corner from where my mum and dad used oh. to live. So um, I sort of think, remember thinking, gosh, I'd go and find out this place. Yeah. And I went down to look for it and I couldn't find it. It was just a house somewhere. I couldn't find it, tucked away. Uh, and then my friend said, oh, I've got a contact at St. Albans War Game Club. We're going to go along there. And I said, oh, OK, let's go and see what's happening. We didn't go to that place. We went to this other place at a local community centre. And we walked in the door on a Thursday evening and there was a fantastic medieval war game being played using using Essex miniatures. Oh. Um, and the guy that was running the game had built all these fantastic medieval ships to go with it. Oh. And we were doing a sort of medieval um, coastal raid. Yep. So, you know, we were there for the first time. A couple of lads, me and my mate, we were attached to whoever it was that was attacking with these ships. And we played this medieval skirmish game. And it was absolutely mind-blowing. Now... The other thing that's really interesting about that game is that that game was being run by Richard Clark. Ah. Um, so, <laughs> and that's when we first met. So that was probably in about 83, 84, something like that when we, that first happened. Um, was, and, he an, was he an imposing presence even as a young man back then? No, not really. I mean, I just remember him as a bit of an older kid. Um, oh, right. that, you know, it was a big club in those days. We used yeah. to have... When I say big, we used to probably have about 20 people going down there. Oh, yeah. The most influential character, or one of the most influential characters at that club at that time, was a guy called Will McNally. Now, I don't know if you know Will or Bill, as he's sometimes known. He's associated with the uh, Lance and Longbow Society these yeah. days. Yeah. But Bill was the guy who um, used to write his own rules. He used to play a lot of 20 mil plastics. Yeah. He had huge amounts of 20 mil plastics. And he would write his own rules to go with those. And from very early uh, days, I guess, we were subjected to Bill's ideas that actually you didn't need published sets of rules. You could create your own rules to get the game that you wanted. Um, and that was great because I was, I was playing around with the um, Bruce Quarry Napoleonics and that yeah, yeah. sort of thing and looking at what was going on with WRG. And I was thinking, my God, I don't know if I'm really – want to tackle something like this but bill gave us the authority to say you know what if you if you understand a game and you want to play it then how you do that is up to you yeah. and i guess when i look back on it that was something that enabled us to to turn our ideas into war games products you know in years to come yeah. but those early days were were great fun games i just remember going to the local shop in st albans where there was a little guy who used to run a shop called cavaliers and i think he only used to open it on Saturday mornings and in his lunchtime from work. Oh, right. Typical war game shop, in other words. Yeah, I and I used, to, oh, I used to go there with my list of um, Hinchcliffe miniatures. Oh, and I used, to, I used to go up to the counter, you know, and I'd say, um, have you got any BN26? Yeah. And he'd go off to the back of the shop and come back and say, no. i say, okay. <laughs> Have you got any BN twenty sevens? And he go back to me. And you'd be there. being stuck behind me in the queue must have been the worst place to be. Because oh I go God. down there with my pocket money and buy my hinge list over the counter. Fantastic. And, one and I remember one. my Christmases being Christmases were great because I could trade my paper uh, round money, yeah. in, cash that into my mum and say, Mum, send a check off to hinge lift miniatures. Yeah, and yeah. I used to get these lovely boxes of, of toys arriving. So I remember that transition to Napoleonics, twenty five mil Napoleonics. Very, very clearly. Hinchless, um, they used to come in the little cardboard boxes, didn't they, with the tissue yeah. paper? 
every now and then you see those boxes. Somebody might be carrying something around with them or you see them on eBay. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think you can still buy Hinchley if they're through... Yeah. Um, Heinz uh, figures. Heinz, that's right. Yeah, I was looking actually online the other day because funny enough, I'm writing an article about NASA hours um, oh, and my love affair with NASA hours, which goes back to that same experience of, of realising you could get things that you know, that weren't the normal run-of-the-mill troops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God, because also the mention of the war game earlier, uh, Peter Gilder. In fact, I, I shall stand up. The view, the listeners can't see this, but you can see this. and I can, I'm, I can, I'm very impressed. I can flaunt oh, it. I see. My old school shelf is right there. Uh, yeah. Um, what it's there the was... Book. Uh, the book was uh, he did oust we had austerlitz in this didn't we as the napoleonic game but of course that was all peter gilder's miniatures and waterloo is in there as well as and waterloo is in there as well uh, but the the nasas i agree things like the nasas and brunswickers as i'd never heard of until i saw them appearing on peter gilder's war games tables in those fabulous photographs that let's be honest appeared in all the magazines from you know miniature military modeling battle for war gamers miniature war games when Duncan McFarlane was running it, and then the early days of War Games Illustrated, until sadly of course we, we lost Peter Gilder but yeah. yes, I mean, so there's yeah, I'm completely with you on that nostalgia there, Nick, uh, <laughs> with your NAS hours and so on so you you got into club gaming and you, as you're saying you, you had this um, eye-opening experience where someone said to you, well, you know, you can write your own rules. If you don't like the rules that are available commercially, you can write your own. So was th that's, I presume, when you first started dabbling in writing your, your own rules. And can you remember what the first rules you tried writing were? Um, well, I think based on what we learned from Bill, I remember writing some very early things on my own, you know, almost when I was 15, 16, yeah. and, and going back and saying to my chum, we used to play games on, on you know, each other's bedroom floors, go around and set all our, our airfix stuff or grew into. Yeah. Uh, and I remember sort of thinking, actually, we don't need to use these Bruce Quarry rules. Uh, we can use these other things that I picked up from the from the club and, um, and playing those and, and trying to think, well, actually, we can... We can apply this, but really, I guess it wasn't until I got back in touch with Richard a few years later. Mm. So I think he moved away from the club for a short time for some reason. Um, I went to university and did some play-by-mail campaign games right. uh, with some friends, etc. Um, and um, when I came back from there, I got back involved with the club. Uh, Richard was back at the club. The size of the numbers at the club had dropped down a little bit probably right. because they'd been gaming with Richard and he'd upset everybody <laughs> one at one, you know, each person, <laughs> one person each week and they'd all start to leave. Um, no, but when I got back down there, we started playing games and we reconnected. We played a Vietnam game and oh. this is probably late nineties. I can't, there's yeah. too much alcohol gone through the system to me, for yeah. me to remember exactly Pretty when specific, this was. Yeah. yeah. But sometime in the late nineties, went back down there. We played a Vietnam game in 20 mil, big, big game. We used to play an awful lot of before I'd gone, uh, before I'd gone off because, like most gamers, once I started buying figures, I couldn't stop. Good. And I went into many, many campaigns, many periods. So we played this Vietnam game, and we played it with a set of rules that we used and loved. And um, it just, we just played it that night, and it just felt horrible. It wasn't right. giving us the game we wanted. Um, it was overly focused on the technology of what yeah. was going on on the tabletop and not enough on the human side of it. Yeah. And I think that while I'd been away at, at, at university I'd or polytechnic, to give it its correct term in those days, because yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I it wasn't a uni boy, I was a poly, I was a poly lad. Oh, right. um, uh, I think I remember reading Ellis's book, Sharp End of War, and got oh, yeah. into the psychology, mm. et cetera, et cetera, and I realised actually the game we were getting wasn't the game that I wanted it to be. Right. Um, and it didn't reflect the human aspect of, of what that action should have been about. Yeah. So we had a long chat after the game. Richard and I stayed behind, had a chat about it, and we knocked some ideas together. I went away, typed something up. Uh, we took it to the club next week and replayed it. Yeah. We had this idea about using a card system to generate the turn sequence because oh, right. we didn't like the way that was working. We, um, One of us had the idea of, Actually, we should be thinking about how wounds affect a unit yep. because we found that 
units were taking, you know, small man squads were taking two or three dead, and then they were just getting up and running to the next point. You think, well, this is this is nonsense. This is yeah, not yeah. how. This is not what happens. So we wanted to inject some way of making units a bit more sticky, making them more, making casualties more important to them. Mm. Um, and so we came up with the idea of wounds, which which really is where the current concept of shock began. Mm. Oh, it's, I see. Okay. It's, it's generated, and we've grown that as an understanding of actually shock uh, being more about the, the morale implications of what's going on. Yeah. So, we, again, we played those. We quite like that. We went away, chewed it up, played it a bit more, got something that almost worked for Vietnam. And then we said, you know what? Why don't we try this for World War Two? Because this would be good. Yeah, and we yeah. love the system. And then, that, of course, that grew into I Ain't Been Shot, Mum. Right. Uh, which, which, of course, is a classic pun play on words yep. that we... Uh, used to do for a laugh because we were two mates doing it for a giggle. Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. always loved a pun. I've always loved a pun. Oh, really? <laughs> We've never noticed this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and really, it just grew from there. You know, it, it, we 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 wrote that. Um, we played it a lot. We, as with everything, played it to death. Really. Yeah. Um, and then Richard said, actually. You know, we, we got to a point where people were really interested in it. I think the internet was starting up. People started to chat online about uh, rules. And um, we started selling it. And that was where IBSM started. So really that sort of you know, takes us through to the beginning of, of Two Fat Lardies, right. which, which started there as a bit of a pun and has yeah. now grown into, well, you know, it's probably one of the biggest independent publishers of War Games rules in the UK. So Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, where are we now? Probably, probably 15 years or so of... Yeah of effort or more, 15, 18 years. I think 2002 we started right. selling the rules. Good. So wherever we are now, 15, 16, 2000, whatever it is, yeah. <clears throat> That's amazing. Um, and also, you know, you also started probably one of the most frequently misspelled <laughs> war games companies. Uh, if I yeah. see one more person, because yeah. they look at you and Rich and go, oh, two fat yeah. lardies, T-W-O-2. Yeah. And, and yeah. as editor of, of, you know, magazines, I was, constantly you know that must be the most corrected word i ever had when i was going through doing the editing no it's too fat lardies all one word because they're too fat no yeah absolutely <laughs> anyway, it was that, and, and i'm very very grateful to you henry for the time you spent doing that uh, <laughs> it's an absurd name and nobody in their right mind will call a war games company too fat lardies oh, no. but that's not what we started off as and it's you know it's you, you are where you are aren't you i know um because the thing is as well so so that first set of vietnam rules that was the first set of rules that you and rich together produced commercially then uh no the vietnam ones reappeared as charlie don't surf and that was that was oh. the kind of name we gave them but actually I, it was i had been shot mum the world war ii version right okay that was the one that came out first and that right. was home produced you know printed and put in a ring binder and 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 posted off because i can remember first seeing that being played oh my god uh i think it was at the redoubt show in eastbourne the sadly now defunct redoubt show in eastbourne and it must have been i think it was the year before i started battle games because i was doing my background research and going around asking people oh, what would you think if someone stupid <laughs> decided to start a new magazine uh, and getting an ear for wow, wow, what do you want to do that for um and who the do you think you are and etc you know um but yes there was i tell you i think it was the south one of the south end war games clubs um that was putting it on at the redoubt show um in eastbourne and they had this lovely terrain because i can remember thinking oh i being really curious what are those rules they're playing? I've never seen those before. You know, they look mm. completely unlike anything that I've seen before. And the other difference was the guys playing the game were laughing, right? How dare they? <laughs> right? Which is they're one very of those... Cheap of it. I think that's one of those uh, lovely things that you guys actually do introduce to the hobby, or have introduced to the hobby, is that it's, you've got this kind of seriousness about your history, but it's also... Guys, it's a game. You know, you're here to have a laugh with your mates, aren't you? And and a, and a drink afterwards, or perhaps yeah, that's drink. absolutely central to uh, the whole aspect of two fat lardies. You know, being a lardy has become to mean something, and yeah. and part of it is around 
you know what? We're here to enjoy ourselves. You want to have a great game. Yeah. Uh, and we can do that. And it can be historically relevant. You know, we can really be plausible yeah, from a historical yeah, yeah. perspective. But we can also have a good laugh at doing that. And and that laugh can come through silly names or it can come through funny events or silly, you know, uh, side events that can happen in the game. Yeah doesn't matter as long as we're enjoying ourselves we're going to, we're going to play it again and come back and, and you know be with each other because gaming is a social activity absolutely uh, and i think there's there's also that thing that um you know if you're coming from if you say if, let's put this firmly in inverted commas a more conventional war gaming background and you're confronted by something like say chain of command um uh, they're all sharp practice let's say there yeah. are uh Unexpected events. I mean, there are, there are things that you don't find in other forms of war game. There are these unexpected events and happenings, you know, whether it's a tea break or whether you're just inability to command all the troops that you feel ought to be at your disposal in a single yeah. phase or move that I think um, a lot of people f find startling in one way or another. And they, they'll find it startling either in, oh, that's funny, you know, I wasn't expecting that. Or they'll really hate it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think in our early days, certainly, that's exactly what we experienced. Some people loved it, and some people hated it, and um, and I think that's changed over time. However, yeah, I mean, I, I but I would say certainly um, a lot of people see your rule sets as probably kind of marmite in one sense or another, don't they? That they they are either oh my god, yes, this is different and I love it or, Oh my God, this is different. And I really don't approve of this sort of thing. You know, mm, no mm. more of this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's obviously something that you, you guys have consciously introduced into your rule sets in a sense, because you are, you want to reproduce friction. You know, this is the word that, you know, uh, rich, very Clausewitzian in his, you know, mm. in his use of friction. And, and so how deliberate, how conscious a decision has that been for you? And at what stage was it at that very early stage with, I ain't been shot mum, that you were very conscious that the friction is a major component of your games? Um, I think it was very obvious to us early on that it was a huge aspect of what we wanted to do. That 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 um, that actually, if we're doing this right and we're getting the, uh, the we're putting the game at the right levels, that we're putting the people in the decision making shoes of wherever it is we're putting them, company commander, platoon commander. Uh, you know what? There's frustrations that go on there, and it's managing that chaotic. Um, I, I mean, chaos as in it's not completely chaotic. I mean, it's chaos as in. Uh, the word bounded instability. You know, yeah. There's 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 uh, there's outcomes that could happen, and uh, we can say what they might be within a certain range, but we can't say for sure where they're going to be within that range. Mm. So we know what's going to happen. We don't know exactly when. I can send third platoon off around the right to attack the farm from the other side, but I can't say for sure exactly when they're going to be in position and ready to go. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you read any account of any battle that's ever been written, there's always something like that in there. Yeah. We were there ready to go. Where were the other guys? I don't know. We hurried them along. They weren't there. We had to go without them kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's just rife, rife through all the histories. So we felt it was really important to have that there because battles don't unfold as, as, as planned. You know, the plan to get you from A to B might be straight, but you know that the journey that gets you there is is as wiggly as you can possibly get it. Mm. Uh, and we need to replicate that in the games. Mm. And um, if you want to understand that from a, a more modern battle perspective, then I'd say to you that the book to read is Spencer Fitzgibbon's book on the Battle of Goose Green, because oh. that really does talk about how Colonel Jones's plan at Goose Green yeah. and what actually developed at Goose Green was so very different. Yeah, and it's, yeah. a, it's a very, very interesting study of friction in terms of the modern battlefield. So I would say... I can see you're scribbling, Henry. Yeah, because right, I'll are have you that... writing a shopping list, or are you saying that that's a good book? You well, I'm saying it's a good book. I'll make a note of it for the show notes for the for the lovely listeners. Um, yeah, very good book. Uh, now that's fascinating because also then when it actually you get down into you know like the granularity of your rule set uh, and the actual mechanisms that you use to convey this sense of friction and chaos, um, obviously you know the, the standard thing used throughout games you know at war games since the beginning has been dice simple yeah. six-sided dice of one kind or another also how have you kind of compound that by the use of card driven factors as well um so i was interested to hear from you kind of well first of all 
at what stage did you decide to kind of uh, introduce those kind of mechanisms rather than just tables that people would have to kind mm. of, you know, uh, oh, you, you roll your D6, oh, yes, it's a, a plus this, minus that, plus this, minus that, and then you go and look at a WRG style, shall we say, or yeah, yeah. Course. so then you compare it to a table, oh, yes, unit retreats two inches or whatever it happens to be. Mm. Uh, so, but instead of having that you decide to have these um lu- should we say ludic entities there's a good one for you ludic good entities. Lord. Uh, i can get i'm sure i can get tablets from my ludic entities. <laughs> I think you are a ludic entity. Uh, so uh, uh, whether it's dice or, you know, a pack of playing cards of one kind or another. Uh, and feeding on from that, it, the interesting decision you made was basically still, even though they're, they're, they're different from in their use from uh, in a normal war game, they're still D6. You haven't decided to go, oh, right, well, we're going to use D10s or D20s or percentage dice or whatever it happens to be. So ha- what kind of thinking have you done around those actions? actual you know the the things the lumps the cards that you use mm. to reproduce those mechanisms yeah. uh i think we were lucky in as much as we hit on the concept of cards and on the concept of um abstracting some of the detail from the action at an early stage so i'll go back to that vietnam set that we first worked on we introduced cards to give a, a sequence of play because we just liked the way that that let the game flow. So we, uh, I guess I would say um, in some way we chanced upon that right. uh, as, 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 as a way of using it. But actually, I think since then, that, you know, that was the initial encounter. And now I think we're much smarter at thinking about how we use those. Yeah. With the concept of um, uh, abstracting some of those details. So, for instance, in IBSM, when you shoot at something, it's either a great shot, an OK shot or a poor shot. Yeah. And that really was, dri- was driven by conversations we had Again, tying back to some of the seminal reading we did around the experience of being under fire. Mm. You know, if, 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 if I'm here and you're across the road yeah. and you're shooting at me with a machine gun, I don't really much care which machine gun it is to some degree. The fact yeah. is that you're shooting at me and I don't like it. Yeah. Um, and so I can get overly obsessed with the rate of fire of that machine gun. Yeah. Um, or I can just say that I'm under a lot of fire. Yeah. And actually, if you read the account, if you want your games to be narrative in the way that they develop and that's a really important thing for me um actually i want to be able to think about how i would write my game what would be the story of my game yeah and what i'd say is i I was pinned down across the road by a lot of fire yeah 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 i wouldn't say you know the guy gave me uh, 16 rounds from a brand new automatic rifle and three rounds from a colt 45 and yeah and then he threw a grenade 22.6 meters and it went off there yeah that's not how what it feels like to be in that so i don't need to worry about that detail we did the same thing with um so i think war games generally can we tend to, war gamers tend to be detail focused people yeah, yeah so yeah. We get drawn into the detail because it's really attractive to yeah, us yeah. Uh, it's why one. It's one of the reasons why Napoleonic naval war gamers really like to know exactly what sails they've got set on their ships. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't really care what sail setting is. It's what the ship's doing that's more important. Mm. If I'm driving a tank, I don't tell you I'm in first gear, then I'm going to second gear, then I'm in third gear. I don't. I don't need to do that in the game. So why do I need mm. to tell you about sail settings? So that kind, that same kind of obsession with detail, um, I think, doesn't always help. When you're yeah. trying to have a game that's that's got flow to it and it's got enjoyment to it and gives you that sense of story. Yeah, the yeah. thing about dice um, is that two d6 gives you a really good spread of distribution mm-hmm. of results, mm-hmm. and most games you can work into that uh, into that bell curve that goes with two d6. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus the fact that do you remember there was a phase when you, games used to re- use whatever dice they could. I mean, they had a dice box and it had all kinds of dice. In oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I'm I'm a bit of a bugger for this because actually I quite like some of those varieties of dice. Yeah. So in Bag the Hun, for instance, if you play Bag the Hun, your aircraft has a basic move speed and that will be adjusted by a D4. So they'll uh-huh. give you a slight variation on that. So you can say roughly where you're going to be, but you can't say precisely. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, I used to be a big fan of average dice. And, and you know what? I still am a big fan yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Um, yeah, but there is somebody in our rules writing partnership that doesn't really like them. <laughs> I wonder who that might be. Yeah, I wonder who that might be. So um, I think there's still room for average dice. And I think really, as, as gamers, 2D6 or a handful of dice is a nice feeling to have, isn't it? Yeah. And there's something good about rolling them. My dear old dad always used to say, 
whenever I came back or was doing something with Wargaming, he'd say, so, did you roll a double six to win then? Yeah. And in some ways, you know, games need to stand up to that and then realise that that is part of gaming. So 2D6 for me... Uh, works really well. I'm not sure if I've answered your question there, though, Henry. Uh, well, yeah, I think you've gone quite, quite a tower question. I'm not sure if I missed any. Uh, well, no, I, 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 I'll sort of extend it in just a sec, because I, but I do think you make a good point there, and I think it's something that a lot of rules designers make that point. You know, Rick Priestley, another guy, uh, where at the end of the day, what people are used to it, from when they were a kid was getting a game in a box, whether it's Monopoly or Ludo or anything, and there's a couple of do, 2D6 in there, and and you learn that rolling a double one is bad and rolling yeah. a double six is good. And so somehow it's part of the culture. On yeah. the other hand, interestingly, um, I visited John Treadaway a couple of times, uh, you know, currently editor of Miniature War Games, big sci-fi and fantasy gamer. And he's introduced me to some really interesting kind of sci-fi rules where uh, – the the power of an individual type of you know uh, star fighter or star battleship thing you know in space is partly reflected by the type of die it rolls when it comes to say inflict damage so your little fighter might only roll a d4 or a d6 but that big cruiser over there is going to be rolling a d10 or even a d20 yeah. so that it's yeah, a really that's interesting yeah. a quick way of showing that that little fighter can't inflict nearly as much damage unless it's incredibly lucky and does something amazing mm. as that you, you great could... big battle cruiser and you can do something very similar with world war ii naval because you're basically on the yeah. same thing so i've got some i've got some rules in my notebook there about uh sound like they might be quite similar to that in terms of how destroyers and battleships will be trading fire yeah. you know obviously you've got one that's one that's very big uh, and has very big guns and yeah. will do an awful lot of damage if it hits the other one and one that's very small and has very small guns and it won't do much damage when it goes the other way. And sometimes it's having the variety of different dice to do that that allows you to be flexible. But how about this, Henry, for something um, uh, creative? So I like to think that I have creative ideas to add to games, and that's yeah. sometimes, they're, sometimes they work really well and sometimes they're not. So let me tell you about this game that we ran many, many years ago, cool. which was a good fun, one of our Christmas games that we uh, are becoming famous for. And the, it was a Wild West game uh, with individual characters and your character would want to do things. So you'd want to go into the saloon and push the doors open and walk in like John Wayne and leap over the yeah. bar. Yeah. Um, we would say, okay, have a, let's see if you can do that. And one of the things we did was we had a, um, uh, I guess these days you call it a dice bag, but in, in yeah. those days it was just a, a pot. And in that yeah. pot was folded up bits of paper. Right. And on those bits of paper were, were written names of cartoon characters, superheroes, film stars, uh, people that everybody in the room knew. Yeah. Uh, and if you and so if you wanted to go in there and do that act, you pull the piece of paper out of the jar. And if and if the person that you pulled out of the jar was capable of doing that act, then you oh. could do it. And if they weren't, you would have failed. So oh, you know if you, right. if, if, if you if you tried to do that and you pulled out John Wayne or Robert Mitchum, yeah. you would have done it. If you yeah. pulled out. Hilda Ogden or, um, <laughs> or, or somebody like that, it wouldn't have worked. Now, it's a bit wacky, but it's just a way of getting an outcome in a game. And it was for that one game, it was great fun. And I, uh, sadly, I've never been able to find a way that we can reproduce that. The other one, of course, is Richard's, um, Richard's patented system for, for leaving a, a, a Roman chariot race and getting your driver out of the chariot and to safety. And that, was, of course, was the famous Bruce Forsyth play your cards right system. <laughs> You know, we turn the card up, turn the card up, say, right, uh, you've got to go seven inches to the edge of the track. You've yeah. got to get seven right cards to get there. So here you go. Start with the two, higher or lower. Oh, it's a four. Okay, higher or lower the four oh and God. see how they can get through to the end of that. Brilliant. It's just a bit of fun, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. That is fantastic. Um, that kind of uh, ties in nicely um, because I think a lot of people, obviously, uh, a lot of the time, Rich is – primarily seen as the face of two fat lardies probably just because he's noisier <laughs> yeah, yeah. right but so in what how is there a division of roles within the partnership specific division of sure. roles uh yeah there is because as the business grew uh rich decided actually he was going to invest himself in it 100 percent. right uh, so he did that, and I was at the stage. My kids were younger than him. Yeah. It wasn't big enough to support two of us. Mm. So we said, "Okay, Rich, go for it. We're in this together. Uh, you take it forward." And he has actually grown two fat lardies through his own effort. I mean, let me tell you that, that 
But gaming with Richard is fantastically exciting and hugely frustrating at once because he's got, as you know, he's got loads of energy about something. Uh, but the downside of that is that, you know, you can, we can play a game, you can sit there and I can say, oh, I'm going to go away now and I'm going to buy some of this. And you go away and buy it. And next week you meet up and he's already bought it, painted it. You know, not only has he done one of them, he's done 50 of them. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's got a phenomenal work rate, yeah. uh, which is great for, for driving new things. Plus the fact that he wants to make sure that everything we produce is good quality. Yeah. So we play test till we're, till we're sick of it. We play yeah, test. Yeah. You know. Anyway, um, so he has invested himself massively in taking the brand forward and developing it from there. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's because of the efforts he's put in, really. These days, as you, as you know, I run my own consultancy. Yeah, yeah. And it, it sits alongside uh, Two Fat Liners as much as my fascinations there are about decision-making and psychology. Yeah. So we, that's the aspect I think I bring now into the Two Fat Liners yeah. uh, uh, work that we do. So we work together. Richard drives, um, you know, full-time and more yeah. on it. And yeah. what he gets from me is... It's probably not enough time. Does he get enough from me? Well, you'd have to ask him that. But we, um, you know, we do support as much as we can together. Richard goes to uh, nearly all the Lardy games. I probably go to 50% of the Lardy games, Lardy games days. Um, If we're doing a show, we generally do it together. Um, If we're working on a product, then we will, uh, depends on what that product is, who's putting the, the sort of lead on it. Mm. One of us will lead on the creation and production of the product. The other one might do a bit more in terms of design, artwork, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of do whatever needs to be done to get it over the line. But but for sure, he does the donkey work. Yeah, I mean... Because he's, he's donkey, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nay! Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the thing. I mean, I, I've witnessed it as well, where he pushes himself not just to, but often beyond the point of exhaustion. Uh, bless he his heart. He loves it. He, he absolutely loves it. Um, and, uh, you know, things like it's always memorable. You know, we're going to be talking about social media shortly, but, you know, when the whole of Twitter is a buzz because you guys are out in Antwerp or whatever <laughs> uh, at crisis and, you know, the pictures are coming back and it's, it's just evident how much passion you guys put into it. And obviously that's, partly because you are the business the business is you it's not like your employees of a big corporation who are just being paid to be there uh, your your commitment is is complete um and it's wonderful yeah we're, we're, we're gamers we're in a great position our, our hobby and our business are the same thing yeah, yeah. And, I, and i say in my in my other existence you know i say to people look if you're not loving what you're doing what are you doing it for yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and what i see working with richard is somebody who is doing what he loves yeah and what you see is the is the consequence of that yeah absolutely yeah yeah um, and to him i'm sure it doesn't even seem like work apart from when he has to do all that posting because i know that when mail yeah, day yeah. comes and that his house is just full of packages and envelopes and boxes oh god it takes me back. I, well that's right and, and you know i'm always busy on that day <laughs> what a coincidence yeah uh, talk a bit about uh, what you just mentioned in it because your 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 other business as a, as a consultant um mm. you are obviously coaching people who are in positions about making decisions and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so in, in what way do you see that tying in with what you're doing with the Lardies? Um, okay. So I, I work with organizations who want to get better at what they do. Uh, and a lot of that is around strategic decision making. Yeah. So we're going to talk about how we use the Discord app later. Um, mm. And I don't want to jump too much into that. But actually the driver for me to investigate that app came through my business work. Oh. One of the things one of the things I do with corporations is um, strategic or business wargaming. Right. So we're taking scenario based decision making exercises which are which are really exactly the same as war games. Yep. And we're applying them into a commercial perspective. I'm also fascinated about how people behave yeah. Uh, at work and how people make decisions at work. And I do a lot of work, as you say, around coaching and uh, and and that aspect of who am I and how do I show up. Yeah. So that's also a bit like the sort of big man argument you get for IBSM yeah. or leaders in chain of command or force morale in chain of command yeah. or how it is that a pilot makes decisions faster than another pilot yeah. in bag the hum. 
open the door and let in the Ooda Loop because that's where that comes from, right? Oh, and, I'm so glad you mentioned the Ooda Loop, me. <laughs> that takes me back to when I came and interviewed you and Nick, uh, you and Rich for um, Battle Games. Oh my God, that's going back I a few remember. years. Now. Good lunch. We yeah. had a good lunch. I remember a good lunch. Uh, a lovely place, uh, and I remember the, for the first time you telling me about the OODA loop. So perhaps you better explain to people who are going, what the is the OODA loop, what the OODA loop is and why it's relevant. Okay, so in 30 seconds, uh, the OODA loop was developed by an American fighter pilot, and they wanted to understand why it was the Americans would be more successful uh, in, the, in the air war in Korea, when actually the Koreans had some technically better aircraft. And of course, the argument there, as we've known throughout time, and as funny enough, I was reading in a in a pans of upper book this afternoon, you know, oh, right. it's not the machine that decides the outcome, but the man that's in it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so the OODA, the aspect of OODA is, is actually how you go through decision making process. So uh, OODA, O-O-D-A, first O stands for observe. You see what you're doing. The second O stands for orientation, which is contextualizing that situation yep. the, the d stands for decision making what am i going to do mm. and the a stands for act actually doing the act right so if i'm in a fighter pilot if i'm in a fighter aircraft mm. you and i are flying towards each other fighting each other um i have to see you understand the situation contextualize the situation make a decision what i'm going to do and do it yep. and if i can go around that loop faster than you Yep. then I'm going to shoot you down, even if you're in a better aircraft than me. Yep. Uh, and that, in a nutshell, is the OODA loop. Yep. Or even if you're in a better tank than me. Or if I'm in a better <laughs> tank, or if I'm in a better army than you. It yep. doesn't matter. When it comes down to it, it's the human in the system that makes a difference. Yep. So in my, in my professional work, it's the human in the system in organisations that makes a difference. Yep. And how are you working as an individual to... We don't necessarily use the OODA loop, but how do you make decisions and, and how do you behave at work? You know, you are the standard that you choose to to set for yourself, etc. And in the war games context, it's very much about man over machine. Because organizations yeah. are uh, collections of human beings. I don't care how technical work gets. Yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, it's about people working together and being human. And yeah. we talk a lot about well-being at work. I know this is a key issue for you as well. The yeah. interest in this, Henry, this whole idea about well-being is around the human aspect of organizations yeah. and what's the role of the human in the modern work environment. Yeah. And of course, this is true of armies as well, because armies are comprised of human beings. Uh, it, it's interesting that it's almost like uh, the, the OODA loop is, if you like, an academic expression of what the French would call coup d'oeil. So it's yeah. the ability to grasp the situation and make an instantaneous decision uh, faster than the opposition. So you and and this yeah. understanding that, OK, no, wait, wait, wait. Yes, the moment is right now. Not before, not a moment later. It's it, that ability that great generals throughout history have had. But not just great generals. Could it could be a corporal, couldn't it, in a slit trench? Could. Yeah, He's absolutely. Just could. Seizing that moment at just that moment, and this yeah, is and where... what makes him do that. What makes so the, the classic example of this also we talk about is in the famous you know, Band of Brothers is a great example because everybody yeah. knows Band of Brothers. You know what is it that when they when they walk into Carantan they get shot at, everybody hits the ground. What is it that makes the officers and NCOs stand up and move? Because it's you know it's training, isn't it? But it's also yeah. It's also something else. And the best leaders do that in a way that's very natural. And that's they've done that throughout time. Yep, yep. So there you go, folks. Wow, we've managed to cram the OODA loop into a podcast. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I'm contractually good. obliged to make sure that <laughs> every six months. <laughs> Nick should have a copyright symbol next to OODA loop. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so now let's, let's move on a little bit and talk about mm. – um, just quickly about out of the the two fat lardies oeuvre i have to call that because i've actually got the two fat lardies website open here now and it's like oh my god how many rule sets have you now done quite a lot is an answer uh so go, people go to two fat uk and just that banner at the top is you know was there a couple of dozen there at least uh some yeah it's growing and growing and of course now we have risevich press as well which richard is is uh, wholly looking after it's bringing different products through again absolutely i mean and i've been privileged enough to play a part in a couple of those titles in the in the what was the american civil war one i've forgotten the name pick, of it's, pick it's charge pick it's charge and uh, grand armee by dave brown as well yeah um which i was happy to do the layout for and uh they've got 
good response, haven't they? I think it's what's nice about the Rice Fitz Press side is it's it's shown that uh, the respect that the wargaming community have for you, that well-known writers like Dave Brown have said, oh, you know, and they've come to you and trusted you with their baby because I know yeah. what it's like, you know, when it's your own rule set or whatever. Um, so that's a really nice thing, a nice development. But also looking at that vast array of stuff, which of those would you say have been primarily your babies? Uh, okay, well, IBSM, which is our first one, which was, which was truly a, a you know a shared effort between Rich and I, um, and it's now on its third edition. Yeah, yeah, and still going well. I noticed that. Um, uh, at Crisis, for instance, James Morris, just along from us, was playing a version of IBSM to do his 19, uh, 1940 Crete, 1941? Yeah. Uh, uh, his Crete it? game. Yes, Crete game, yeah. Yeah, so he was he was there playing with that uh, using IBSM. IBSM uh, continues to be really, really very popular uh, and it's quite hard to get hold of now. So uh, obviously you get the PDF, but the hard copies are I'm not even sure if there are any. I don't know about that. Wow. Oh, I'm, 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 not, I'm not a stock controller. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so IBSM was definitely ours. Kiss Me Hardy, you'll be familiar with. Kiss Me Hardy was a uh, uh, was entirely mine, and that was produced to uh, uh, initially to satisfy our local club to make people play Napoleon Naval games that wouldn't play it. Oh right! Uh, and because it was just all the rules we were using previously were horrendously technical, so we just took all that out. I took all of that out. Uh, took all the difficult things about sales setting out the rules and produced Kiss Me Hardy. And when we went, um, when we started selling Iron Bean Shop Mum, we said, well, okay, why don't we, let's, let's see, let's push these out there as well and see what happens with these. So yeah. we put Kiss Me Hardy out. Kiss Me Hardy was, is still a very popular rule set for Napoleon Naval Gamers. And there's lots of pressure for me to do Kiss Me Hardy 2. Oh, right. uh, and I do have. Uh, stuff on Kiss Me Hardy too, but I'm not going to make any commitment to what it's going to look like and when. Right. Uh, at the moment, at the moment in my head, Kiss Me Hardy Two is very different to Kiss Me Hardy One. Oh, so, okay. Uh, there's lots of differences that need to be worked through on that. So it wouldn't just be like a, a, a few amendments and tweaks to the no, first version, no, be a, a rewrite effectively. Yeah, and that of course is always a scary thing to do because people like what they've already got. Yeah. So yeah, if you yeah. give them something totally different, you're taking a big risk. Yeah. But anyway, so Kiss Me Hardy Two is out there in some shape or form. That's entirely mine. Bag the Hun is entirely mine, right. uh, and that's various different versions of Bag the Hun. Bag the Mig, Algae, of course, was the first World War spin-off. Yeah. And Bag the Hun's had a bit of a re, uh, resurgence this year. I mean, the Meeples guys did a product review of it in the summer, and it's been out 10 years. So uh, it was great, it's great that they do that, and I know that they the core of people that are playing it and enjoying it. I still love playing it. As with all our rules, we never get to play the back catalogue often enough. Yeah, because yeah. working on whatever we're developing now. Of course. Bag of the Honey Entire Mine. If the Lord Spares Us, which is our um, First World War in the Middle East sets of rules, which oh, are right. brigade level games for 15, 10 mil or 6 mil figures, yeah. that again was entirely mine. Um, and actually, that's the photo that, uh, of the Turkish artillery. Oh, that you, right, that you very kindly donated you. for my WSS article. Thank you very much indeed, sir. You're more than welcome. So that was, that's mine. Uh, Chain of Command and Sharp Practice are really Richard's with sort of consultant input from me, uh, right. but they are really his, his babies, and he's uh, and they grew out the time when he was investing hugely uh, yeah. in terms of time in the business, and I was able to have less input. So that's just purely the way that that's gone. And uh, What a Tanker, of course, which is out came out this year and has yeah. been – fantastic uh, product for us and a great fun set of rules to play with. That was entirely mine um, in terms of the idea where that went through. And of course, we play it over the, you know, we play it to get it to the shape where it's ready to yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, but that's entirely uh, from, from my concept. So there's enough of my catalog in there for it to, um, you know, for me, for it, for me to still go to the Christmas dues. <laughs> The Christmas dues, which now, well, we I'll move on slightly because obviously the Christmas dues now, uh, you know, with your odd cast and everything, that how did Sid get involved with all this? Mick? Sid, uh, don't tell him, but Sid is a lovely fella, absolutely cracking bloke. He came to our club 
oh, I've got no idea when, I can't remember. But he just fell in with us and fitted really nicely. Right. And um, to be fair, we take the mickey out of Sid, something terrible. Oh, I've uh, never noticed, really. No, you would never have noticed, <laughs> would you? Um, uh, but he's such a great bloke to be with. He's, and he is a phenomenally talented, creative uh, painter, wargamer. Oh, as yes. well um, and so he brings a really different aspect to what we do yeah. um, which is normally wild and wacky and and covered in flowers and and you know yeah. what would Rubens say about this particular battlefield Sid and, and he'd give you that interesting <laughs> perspective on it but he's got some great ideas and, and he challenges on a different level he's very aesthetic about about actually how the game looks and feels right. and he's very good at giving us uh, some thoughts on that yeah. So yeah, he's a uh, he's a top bloke. Yeah, yeah. Because I can remember, oh, oh, again, ages ago, in battle games, didn't I uh, publish a thing him painting some World War One figures or something he'd done? He he was collecting yeah. a lot of World War One stuff. Um, it's obviously yeah. quite a few years ago now. How time flies. Well, um, the mud and the blood. Sydney had him put into mud and the blood, right, uh, and he did it. did a lot of World War One stuff for that. And he's a very talented terrain maker, yeah. and he made these beautiful, beautiful trench balls um, that, that did the round of the shows for a couple of years. Yeah, absolutely stunningly beautiful. Yeah, and of course, the great irony is that we took these we took these beautiful World War One trench balls to crisis, um, and the year we took the most beautiful game imaginable was the only year we didn't win a trophy. <laughs> um, and Sid had put all this effort into the terrain oh, and he no. was, you know, he really, really deserved to get something. And he, he said he wasn't disappointed, but, you know, you could see in his eye there was a, oh, no, we didn't get anything. Oh, he, no. he, he, he would blame himself for uh, for, oh, you know, for that. But actually, we just had a jolly good laugh. And I think the next year we won a game which was a winter war game where the terrain was a bed sheet. Um, so <laughs> that just rubs salt into his wounds, of course. I know, I know. Well, it has to be said, certainly in crisis, you guys just keep coming home with a bacon. It's unbelievable. It's like, why not just put your name permanently on the damn trophy, to be honest? but No, I'm, I'm, no I don't think that's going to be the case for, you know, forever. Oh, uh, uh, be I think we've been very lucky to get where we've got with that. We have a great time at crisis. Yeah. But, yeah, a noticeably great time. Uh, but it's really nice that you've kind of, uh, you know, Sid's got involved doing the pod, the oddcast podcast with you guys. And it's yeah. completely different from anything else that's out there. I mean, here's me kind of, uh, you know, I suppose with my Q&As as well, I'm getting close to sort of 20 podcasts I'll have done now, not counting yeah. any of the ones I did with Neil Shuck over the years, View from Miranda mm. and all the rest of it. Uh, and I know uh, it's it's an interesting medium to explore and it t- because, you know, and this is where we can talk a bit about online presence and that kind of stuff, because podcasting uh, has become a really interesting kind of addition to the uh, online repertoire of both gamers and producers and the fans and all the rest of it. So uh, you guys having your own odd cast, but with with uh, with him as the compare of the show if you like uh yeah. is uh, you know a really interesting idea so how did that actually sort of come about then how did sid being the circus ringmaster as it were yeah uh, um you know i really can't remember i think the very first i think the very first one we did was in a car when we went to salute and we just told our story of salute and i think sid was in that uh, and and because he was very much part of our, our you know the, the two fat ladies um, crowd, if you like, that worked at shows. Yeah. Uh, it was just very obvious that, that Sid should be in there and do that. So and he and he's he's he's, he's well you know as I say we give him a hard time. He's, yeah. he's, he's a top guy. <laughs> he, he's a top guy for putting up with it. Um, oh, for sure. And I can't remember how we got involved with the Henry. Sorry, I can't remember. Oh, right, answer. that's right. It's just it's quite an interesting format because you know, there you are at Lardy Towers or whatever, and you're going past the library and you know through the main hall and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of well, it's a show with I, I, a persona of its own. I think the thing that's different about the odd cast um, is that you and I are talking now over the internet, and actually it's okay, isn't it? But it would be so much better if we're sitting next to each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the odd cast, of course, we're sitting next to each other. And we, so, you know, they, we get – there's all just the atmosphere of being together, which is fantastic. Yeah. Now, I know that the, the the compromise on that is the sound quality, which might not always be the best. And we're not technical 
gurus. Right. Uh, so we just record it, and and actually Richard does the uh, Richard does the editing on the odd cast. Oh, right. uh, and to to it wouldn't be too much of a disservice to say that he's probably the least technically minded of any. <laughs> You know, I think you may have seen on Twitter this week, I put a post on there that um, today I'm mostly being Richard Clark's personal IT support desk. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way it goes. At the moment, of course, we're working on the um, our annual publication, the specials that have become an annual. Yeah. So we're um, working quite closely on, on exchanging files and doing images, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, we're not very technically minded, but the old cast just gives us a chance to share our enjoyment for what we're doing, really. You know, yeah. And, and, um, People seem to like listening to it. They obviously can't find anything better to do. But people <laughs> like to listen and paint uh, and listen in the car. Um, yeah. And there's so much crap in the wide world at the moment. Yeah, people wouldn't yeah. want to switch off and listen to something else for a couple of hours. Absolutely. God, if people or, or three and a half hours in your case, Henry. In my case, yeah, God. If people put up with my three and a half hours, they put up with anything. But... Um, yeah, God takes me away. But anyway, uh, yeah, interesting point about Rich, because you say he's sort of a bit of a technophobe. But on the other hand, I, I admire Rich uh, because he's keen to try and grasp the latest technology and software and that kind of thing. Because I remember giving him some coaching on Adobe yeah. Illustrator and InDesign and Photoshop and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he was uh, in, the, I can't remember, it was a few years ago now, he was in the midst yeah. of wanting to do, I think it might have been at the start of the Rice Fist press stuff and, yeah. just, and you know i was able to kind of uh, make him understand that he completely misconstrued how certain things worked in illustrator or whatever uh, but he was keen and then once he's got the knowledge he's off you know is, that's yeah. it. thank you very much henry that's great and whoosh he's off and suddenly he's produced the thing you think my god you know if all the students i've taught over the years because i've done some you know software teaching and stuff over the years mm. if all my students have been that enthusiastic with it fantastic uh but i think also so that's one of those instances where he finds it easier to grasp something because he then he he knows he's going to use it right there. Yeah, and then. absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, he he uh, he won't mind me saying it, but he is a control freak. You know, he's got to be. He yeah. needs to be doing it himself because then he knows he can get it done the way he wants it to be done. Absolutely. Uh, and so he will want to learn it and do it himself. Uh, and that's that's great. He's. I don't know how he does it all, but um, I bet he does because I don't have to do it. Yeah. Uh, so moving on from that kind of technology and podcast and stuff, I mean, one of yeah. the things obviously that people uh, have noticed a lot is that you and Rich and Sid actually on his own account are very noisy on social media. You know, you guys, uh, oh God, I mean, look, I mean, you've got the website, you've got the blog, you've got at least one Yahoo group still bubbling along, isn't it? And uh, online mm -hmm. chat rooms and you've got Twitter and you're on Facebook as well, I, I imagine. I, I don't check in there very much yeah, yeah. um obviously because uh, obviously i'm aware of this because i wouldn't have been able to start battle games at all were it not for the emergence of uh, chat rooms social media that kind of stuff to make the world aware that i had anything to bring to market at all um and i i kind of recognize that you guys have gone through a similar journey where effectively the growth of social media having a a a, a, a good sustained online presence has basically created a marketplace for you that might not have been available how were you restricted to the old traditional methods yeah sure yeah and without doubt two fat lines wouldn't have grown the way that it has if the internet hadn't have grown uh, alongside at the at, you know at a similar uh, rate we can contact and game with people from across the across the world. You know, the people playing larger games literally all over the world now. Yeah. Uh, and that wouldn't have been possible without the internet. So the social media is a huge part of, um, of, of being a gamer, actually. I don't think it's really... You can sort of separate out Two Fat Liders to some way because mm. whether it's Two Fat Liders or whether it's just Nick Skinner as a war gamer, yeah. um, you know, it's it's social media with the aspect, emphasis on the social. War gaming is a fairly lonely hobby sometimes. Yeah. Um, this gives you a chance to share stories and what other people are doing and yeah. have a bit of a laugh with people online uh, and it's just a great way to connect with people that are playing our games yeah. a massive part of lard has always been the lard community it's actually uh, you know we 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 want to be involved we want to play the games uh, we want to be seeing what what's happening out there and um, how people are using our rules you know, we're probably the most contactable 
um, set of rule lawyers on the planet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would imagine. And, um, you know, it, and it's and it's great to see because it, it just it's just fun to be part of a community that, that's buzzing. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, that's certainly what it's what it's at. And Twitter is growing. All of our rules have Facebook pages. I was on the Water Tanker um, Facebook page today, posting a tabletop teaser. Uh, oh, really? You know, for, for uh, the community to see what would you do in this situation. Yeah. Um, and that's that was great fun too. And it's impossible to monitor them all, however, because yeah. there are, as you say, there are so many. Uh, but there's such a body of people now that can, you know, that will respond to rules queries. Yeah. There's so many people that know the rules better than we do, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, they kind of self-manage the rules queries. Yeah. Um, but the ability to share great games and great looking games online is, is what social media really gives us. Plus, we can take the mickey out of Sid on social media <laughs> as well as when he's in the room with us. Have you been uh, taken by surprise at the extent of the kind of online tribe that you has built up for you guys over the years? Because it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is huge, and it's it's grown very much in that word of mouth. We, we grow grew very much through word of mouth, and uh, and some people were very evangelical about what lard meant yeah. and maybe they sort of picked it up and run with it and, and yeah. grew some ideas around them wherever they were. They may, they may have been in the Midwest of America yeah. or in or in Spain or anywhere where there's this little pocket of, of lard as a sort of taken uh, root. Um, but I think for me it was um, going onto Facebook. So I, I there were, when I went first went onto Facebook as – and looked at what war games groups were on there. There were lots of war games groups, the two fat lardy product. I didn't know anything about them. You yeah. sort of think, well, there's a, oh, look, there's a kiss me Ardy Facebook, or there's a, there's, a, I didn't know anything about that. Where did that come from? Yeah. Uh, but you have to realise that you know it's not about you. It's about the rule set, and and it's just about community of people coming together. Yeah. So um, you know you apply to join uh, a, a page that's been set up around your own product, which is oh, quite I know fun. it's weird, isn't it? You ought to get automatic <laughs> membership, surely. <It's> my... <laughs> It's me. It's mine. Uh, yeah, it, I, I understand what that's like, this notion that the the thing that you've produced has a life beyond you, outside of you. Because I know this from, my, you know, the book, The Blooming Wargaming Compendium, where, um, you know, it will suddenly crop up somewhere or someone will send me an email or someone will come, come up to me at a show and say, oh, God, you, I've, I've got your book. And it's this it's it's an entity of its own that's separate from you and that people yeah. uh particularly with my book i found people can make it or with the magazine as it used to be people can make assumptions about uh who you are as a person because of that thing you produced yeah and also think people think that you have this photographic memory of what you wrote oh that article you did henry in 2007 in battle games i disagree with it completely well probably i do now as well and i can't even remember what it was kind of thing. Well, I, I, I can so associate with that and i think that um you know this year with the publication of water tanker so water tanker was my sort of baby if you like yeah and, and i know richard talks about this uh, quite a lot it's that feeling that actually you know, you created something. This is your baby. You put it out there into the world, and you and you know people will buy it from you and take it and play with it. Yeah. And you really want them to enjoy it and love it. But actually, some people don't enjoy it. And some people don't love it, and that's yeah. really quite frightening as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To say this is, you know, I've, I've put my whole self into this. Um, you take it away, and you you do what you want with it. I hope you like it. If you don't like it, please be gentle with me. Yeah, yeah. And I know that actually, one of the things Richard says, uh, and he said it on on uh, sort of social media or on podcasts is it's it's actually the, the day a rule set goes live is often the, is often the most punishing because yeah. the first thing you get is people saying to you what's not in it yes. you haven't done this or you haven't done that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 then you get over that and then you get the the hopefully what is the mass swell of of um appreciation that that people are enjoying what you like but that first part can be quite painful oh yeah i mean i can remember the first one star review i got for the wargaming compendium you know i would have thought for the bulk alone you bastards it ought to get two <laughs> stars you know but yes and and you're... maybe i should go back and edit that <laughs> <laughs> because perhaps you should uh the, but yes exactly what you mentioned there where people say oh, yeah uh, but there's nothing about this in there well yeah you know uh, and it's like um joe piddington with miniature wargaming the movie that's just you know going yeah. out to the kickstarter backers and, and release yeah. and you know 
some people have given it one star reviews on an internet movie database simply because it doesn't contain stuff that it never set out to contain in the first place. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's one of those amazing things. And I think that people can be terribly harsh and react very severely to stuff uh, with no thought about the, you know, what that makes all the people involved over the years that it took to make how it makes sure. them feel you know and it's the same with the rule right you know it's it, it's you know it's just one of those things isn't it and, and it is and i would say actually on that on that same point henry because you might somebody might react to that and say actually in that case i'm not going to do it i'm not going to do it because yeah. uh you know i, 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 I don't want to put my ideas out there because people might not like them the other side of that is you can get really positive unintended consequences yeah. so with what a tanker in particular this year has been the story of people playing water tanker and coming back to us and saying, I've played this with my kids, with my yeah, wife, yeah, with yeah. my son's girlfriend. They're now playing war games. They've never done it before. We did a game at Selwig, a pres uh, participation game at Selwig, where the average age around the table, even including me, was about 10. Wow. Uh, and, and you kind of think, Insane. actually, un un unintentionally, you yeah. created something that's bringing people into the hobby. And, yeah, and that's yeah. like, well, I hadn't thought about that when we released it. Just a bit of a, you know, a, a fun rule set uh, about, you know, people who had tanks could play with tanks. Yeah. And if I hadn't taken that leap and put that out there and said, you know what, let's do it. Because it was a bit of a risk with Water Tanker because it was yeah. very different to what we put out before. Sure. Uh, and we weren't sure how people would take it. So we've had a, a really positive year on the, on, the, on the back of that. And that take up by young people and new people to the hobby yeah. has been uh, as, as really fired me, and actually, it's really um, uh, made me go into the new year with added energy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Because also, I mean, coming not full circle, but back slightly, where we're talking mm. about the extent of the support that you've got for your products and stuff. And uh, I've always thought of this, um, you know, when I think about the Wargaming Compendium or the people who supported Battle Games through Thick and Thin or the people who supported me when I was at Major War Games with Battle Games, you know, and all the rest of it. Um, it's this sense that what you're building is a tribe. And of course, that's been really important to me. You know, we can talk about this now. Um, mm. For me being able to launch what I'm doing now, the Patreon thing. Yeah. Um, because after I, you know, as I talked about in the in the long Q and A podcast I did for patients last time out, I talked a lot about you know the journey I've been through in the last couple of years since I quit the magazine, and then that was followed by you know some family tragedy and all the rest of it that kind of turned my life upside down a bit. But then mm. discovering that I had got this core, and it's not huge. You know, a couple hundred people, hundred, couple hundred people, core support group, if you like, a tribe who were prepared to say, we, whatever it is you're doing, Henry, we like the contribution you're making. We miss the contribution you were making with the magazine, say, and we are happy to support what you want to do, almost whatever it is you want to do mm. within the hobby. Yeah. Um, now. For me, that was – this is why I kind of uh, – you know, because I was familiar with Kickstarter, but Patreon was a relatively new concept to me. And so I kind of signed up to a couple of other people doing totally different things who, you know, mm. were doing Patreon gigs. And kind of, oh, okay, I sort of get it. And this idea that, well, I suppose it is a bit like back in the old days, in the 18th century, if you were a landscape painter, you would have a patron, you know, probably an aristocrat of mm. some sort, mm -hmm. who basically said, well, you know, as long as you provide me with, you know, a dozen nice landscape paintings every year, you know, here's a stipend, you know, here's, here's some kind of support for you. And I kind of, I like that idea, but I also recognize all oh, that, this is a risk. I mean, it could fall flat on its face. It could not take off at all. Um, but you know me, because having, having started a magazine yeah. a few years ago, I thought, yeah. I almost thought, you know, sod it. I'm going to have a go anyway. You know, what, yeah. what, what can I lose? Basically, either it succeeds or it fails. Let's see how far it goes. And so I was very, you know, enormously gratified when so many people came on board so quickly um mm. and and i still i'm it's still an experiment i'm still seeing this mm. as an experiment because obviously it would be nice i'd i'd really like it if i was able to make a full-time living 
from it. But the mm. fact of the matter is, so far, for reasons that I'm still work, trying to work out, it's it's got to a certain point, but then not beyond. And I think it's going to take mm-hmm. you know quite a lot of effort to try and move it to a point beyond this. And mm-hmm. that's you know some calculations I've got to make about that. Now I know um, that. Uh, you weren't one of the first people to come on board. No, I wasn't, and we, and we, and we spoke about that from quite yeah. early doors. I think, and and yeah. I, and and this is I quite like to talk about this, yeah. and I think the patrons as well would be, and the people listening to this who you know after a week or so who aren't patrons because this is going to go live to the public afterwards and that you know they yeah. may well be thinking well you know I, I, henry's a decent bloke and like, oh, i quite like what he does but oh this patron thing i'm not sure about that so i'd be really interested for you to tell people um you know what your reservations were have been mm. about patron as a concept uh maybe even in particular relationship to myself you know because that's the relevance and also other than me, you know, begging and groveling <laughs> and pleading, uh, what is it that made you decide, oh, OK, then I'll give it a go? Uh, I think probably the, the groveling and pleading um, was, was was helpful, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so let me answer that one first. I, th- I think actually your voice needs to be heard, Henry. Right. So that's so principally that was why I came in and, and, and backed you for that, because actually – you are um, an essential voice within the hobby. And I think people do benefit from your wisdom, your depth of understanding, and just the fact that you can talk about every aspect of wargaming. It's a broad landscape, and actually you're the one guy probably who could sit and talk about any aspect of that. Uh, and the work you've done over the years with, with battle games and the books you've done, et cetera, et cetera, make you backable from that context mm. now so i had no worries about that i've absolutely no worries about that now as you as as we discussed at partisan wasn't it or somewhere so was, we'll come, yeah, yeah. we had a chat about it yeah, and i yeah. said to i said to you that i was nervous about backing you and the reason i was nervous about you about you about backing you uh was based on experience of, of running my own business and uh, sometimes being yourself and doing your own thing is something that you think is going to liberate you. Mm. And you think you're going to go from actually having one boss to having no boss. Yeah. Whereas actually what you do is you go from having one boss to having hundreds of bosses. Yep. And my nervousness was that by extending into Patreon in the way that you were and saying to everybody, you know, back me, you're making each one of those, you're turning each one of those people into a, a key stakeholder in you mm. and somebody who potentially would demand something from you. Mm. And it was that, and I know this for myself through my own business, what this can mean in terms of the stress that can generate within you yeah. in terms of what the level of obligation you feel you have to deliver uh, for what potentially might not be a, a lot of money. Yeah. And so you could, you know, you can have, I don't know, 200 people backing you for a pound you know, mm. or a dollar or whatever it is, mm. and you feel massively, massively indebted to the fact that you got to give them their dollars worth. Yeah. Uh, but actually, that's only $200. Go- and, and, you know, to be fair, how can anybody do anything in the modern world with, with a small sum of money like that? So you yeah. potentially create a stress for yourself. Mm. And that was my nervousness about backing you, as, mm. as you know. Um, however, you've, you've dived into it. Uh, you're creating some interesting and different content. Uh, and I think I'm really interested to know how you – how you're going to move it on. I know you're not, you don't have the answer to that yet. Mm. Um, but as a model of supporting what you do, it's, it's, I don't know, I get the sense that it's gaining traction. You say it's sort of slowed down a little bit. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like in Castaway when he tries to get off of the island. You've got to get over that. It's got to get yeah, over yeah. The, the, the sort of reef, hasn't he, to get into the open yeah. seats. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things uh, he, uh, he's clicking to my Patreon uh, site. One of the things uh, when you start is you create goals. It's like in Kickstarter mm. where you have your goals and your stretch goals and all the rest of it. And that's why right on the front page of the, of the site, uh, you know, we are currently at what have I called it battalion level. And I've I, I, because what happened was, I th- let's have a look. I mean, I set the first goal at a hundred dollars a month. Second, uh, $250 a month, and then the third at $500 a month, and then the next one's at uh, $1,000 a month. Mm. And for each of those things, I said, well, for that amount, this is what I can afford to do. Yeah. 
Mm. Effectively, yeah, I, it's important to do that, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And actually, that was one of the most useful things that Patreon have done because it it imposes some discipline on you not to overpromise in in yeah. that regard. I mean, yeah. there's there's some there's certain problems elsewhere which I'll come on to in a sec. But certainly, I mean, first of all, I was gobsmacked because we went through the the first, second, and third goals within a week of me starting. It yeah. was mind blowing. You know, I'd sort of thought, well, okay, maybe in the first month I'll get to the first one and I'll just be doing a blog post or something. And then a couple of months later, the next one, I was just completely blown away because in the space of basically January of this year, when I launched, um, it just went whoosh <laughs> straight through the first three goals, which had kind of got me to this level. And mm. the next level was at $1,000 a month where I said, well, okay, if I'm getting $1,000 a month, I can do a bit more, you know, I can afford to mm. do a bit more. So mm. that, in a sense, uh, has kept me wise about, well, okay, I've, you know, I've got it written down in, in, in my workbook over there that, okay, uh, uh, roughly these times each month, each month, this is what I'm going to be doing, and this is roughly how much time I can afford to be spending doing it, right? Yeah. Um, what I didn't expect foolishly was i thought yeah lots of people will join at the dollar level and the two dollar fifty level maybe some five dollars maybe even a few ten dollar things what i had no understanding was that it's like when they sell the the, the cabins in a posh luxury cruise the mm. cabins that sell first are the most expensive cabins right mm. i know mm. this because i used to work as as a as a travel agent years ago and so what happened was actually suddenly i had like five generals uh, 12 brigadiers and so on and so forth and it was filling up from the top down and of course then mm. i looked at what i'd committed to produce for those top level people which is basically well if you're a general i'll have your children kind of thing <laughs> 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 you know, no. but you know, I, I'll I can do, see people leaving in their hundreds. I'm leaving in their hundreds now, but basically, yes, you know, oh yes, I'll design personalised scenarios for you, and this, and I thought glibly, oh, I'll probably have, I don't know, half a dozen of those. Whereas instead, I've got a list of like thirty scenarios I've got to design for people. You know, so th there is that kind of thing that I'm, you know, I'm asking everyone, please be patient. I'm trying to catch up with that. You know what, Henry? I bet that I bet that most people don't don't, you know, they don't really need a scenario half of those people. Uh, well, they maybe not, but I've. This is where my sense of honour and commitment does come in. You know, yeah. this is where. Okay, you well, I think therefore deciding what you're going to give them and and setting those goals for yourself is so important that was that Absolutely. going back to my worry what is how many children is henry going to have by, <laughs> by uh, some of these other characters not, in the making of the industry but 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 basically that's the only thing so far that i thought oh gosh yes okay but everyone's been brilliant everyone's been brilliant and i'm actually the the only thing that stopped me is actually because i've also got this previous commit which is finishing writing this bloody book of mine you know but let's let's not go there let's not this is it crops up as you've noticed on every q a session when's more gaming campaigns gonna be <laughs> listen henry you're talking to a guy who's got lots and lots of projects uh in a state of not quite finished yet um <laughs> so i understand exactly where you're at but basically, uh, I was conscious of that. And also, uh, because, you know, what you're saying about, oh, yes, this commitment to lots of people, it was like that running the magazine, you know. Mm. And there are some, and and let's say, you know, the, the, the difference is that when you run a magazine, the cost of an annual subscription is the same for everyone. And what became apparent when the magazine, you know, hit the buffers was there are some people just contacted me and said, Henry, don't worry about it. I don't want any of my money back. You just don't care about that just look after yourself you know and then there was other people who were like you're a crook you're a criminal i will demand my money back i'm going to call the police on you you know fortunately however the, the proportion of people who were like that was tiny but the trouble mm. is when you're a creative person you always remember mm. the bad reviews right you mm. can have 10 five star reviews and one one star review and it's that one one star review that's like a dagger to the heart isn't it yeah well so, it's got, it's a behavior profile henry as well isn't it it's actually other people being more important than yourself 
Um, and, 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 and a lot of people fall under that category of actually, I want to make sure you're okay. And once you're okay, I yeah. can look after myself. Yeah. And that's, and I see quite a lot of that in you. So I think you, you definitely have that. Yeah. And I know that if that's uh, left unchecked, if you like, uh, that can that can generate stress and, and issues. Absolutely, yes. I'm. Someone said I'm other focused. Is that the psychological way of saying it? Uh, please someone. others. You could talk about drivers. You could say it is please others driver. All ah, right, there we go. Yeah. But uh, I do. I mean, I'm. I. You're quite right. I'm absolutely useless at doing stuff for myself. I'm really working on that at the moment in the last year or so. Uh, and but we'll kind of basically throw myself in front of a tank for someone else, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. which is not always healthy. You're quite right. Uh, so, but that's quite interesting hearing what you've said and your, your concerns. So now you've been a patron for a little while. How, I mean, how do you, how do you feel about it? How do you, how uh, do you... I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, whatever I'm getting from you, Henry. Um, yeah. so if, if you want to, if you want to put it in that way, uh, how do I feel about it? I'm, I'm committed to it. I mean, I don't know how long I've been backing you now. Uh, and have I listened to everything you produced? No. Um, am I sitting there waiting for it to come out saying, where's Henry with his bloody podcast or, you know, what, what's he doing? No, I'm not doing that either. But what I am knowing is that actually the hobby is getting your voice in it. And that is actually what it comes down to, because, as I said, the hobby needs to be listening to you. Uh, and um, luckily, through this forum, it does. So if people want to keep listening to Henry and keep being able to hear you, it's important that they back you. So if you are listening to this and you're not a backer, you know, Henry, you don't have to put big chunks of money Henry's way, um, although he'd love you to. It's just a, a couple of a couple of dollars. Make sure that actually um, the conversations that you want to have in the hobby and the questions that need to be asked in the hobby are being asked. That I mean, that's really, I'm flattered. I'm really interested. So, um, you know, trying to keep my head small at the same time. But what, so I'm interested because obviously I kind of, uh, I think I know what I want to contribute to the hobby. Yes, but, yes. So, but obviously that's not necessarily the way that others perceive me so i'd be really interested mm. to hear so what you said there uh, uh what do you see as my contribution to the hobby uh i would say well you're independent henry right and i think that counts for a huge amount so you can uh you can challenge you can ask questions about how you see hobbies being developed you can put questions to games designers figure companies uh, you know, so you can actually you've got the credibility, I think, to be able to ask them the difficult questions and you understand the hobby. And I think so. Therefore, uh, you can be a voice that holds people to account to some degree. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I also think you're uh, a voice that brings people together. Uh, oh. And it's the community that you can grow through your conversation. I'm a huge I'm a huge believer. My, my, my business is based on the power of dialogue mm. to change the way that people uh, work together. Mm. Uh, so I think that actually the more time people spend together talking about things, mm. we, you know, people generally are scared of things that they don't understand. Yep. Uh, actually, the way we understand things is by talking about them. Mm. So the more people in, can engage with you and talk with you and be a part of the conversation, uh, and the more even using your uh, the podcast as conduit so that other people in the hobby <laughs> can speak through you, yeah. If you like, that's also an important part of it. Mm. I guess what I'm doing actually is talking to the hobby through you mm. uh, as well in this. Uh, I think that's a massively important thing. Because one of the things that I know a lot of detractors uh, throw at me every time is, oh, Henry, he's, old, he's so old school. How do you see that? Because I've... You know, when I look back, even through battle games and all the rest of it, and I did a count at some point, or someone did it for me, maybe, maybe Bart Vetter's over in the Netherlands, did a count mm. of actually the number of old school articles as a proportion, a proportion of what I did was actually something tiny. It was like less than 5% of the total yeah. content that I yeah. put out there. But it's obviously a label that some people have kind of stuck as a barcode on my forehead and are reluctant to change their opinion and i've always found that uh curious mm. and also to be honest rather frustrating because it's mm -hmm. like i feel like i've got a lot more to say and to contribute than than just talking about don featherstone and charles grant you know well uh, labels are hard to break away from yeah. and you do know about charles grant and don featherstone i know you're very proud of the heritage of wargaming 
but we're also talking about, and we're still going to talk about it, I think, about yeah, yeah. how you use you know, uh, apps in, com- in computer wargaming. Yeah. Well, if, if that's old school, then I'm a Dutchman. Um, so, <laughs> yes, you know, yes, we're, we're going to go and talk about that in a minute. And, and, yes. and so therefore that kind of, well, actually, that's that label doesn't doesn't fit. Maybe you can talk old school. Yes. And if I wanted to understand the books of Donald Featherstone, who would be my guru to that? I probably would come to you. Right. Um, I've got lots of Featherstone books downstairs uh, and and uh, they mean something to me. I don't yeah. collect them to read them necessarily. I collect them because of because uh, of what they are yeah. uh, rather than what's in them. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. Yeah. And, um, and I, so I think, that, I think there's that aspect to it. But I think actually, you know, what you're doing through talking to me about what we're going to talk about in a minute is is proving that actually that label no longer fits. Yeah. Also, however, I, th- I think, interesting, someone like Don Featherstone or the original Charles Grant would have been fascinated by this latest development and and so ladies and gentlemen listening let me explain this uh, i noticed on twitter that uh nick has been running some experimental games uh using uh, a piece of software an online chat room effectively called discord d i s c o r d and what you were using it for nick was a a a kind of kriegspiel scenario wasn't it and now this uh, because i as a as a patreon uh um creative um when i joined patreon they offered me oh yes there's all these other kind of plugins and bits and pieces that you can use alongside your patreon thing for connecting with your patrons and one of them was this thing called discord and i'd never heard of this before and i went and had a look and it seemed to be the example they gave was some sort of chat room with a load of kids who were playing video games talking to each other whilst they were playing video games and it sort of left me a bit cold and baffled to be honest so i kind of ignored it and then seeing this just uh, was it last week or the week before uh, nick using this system to conduct war games suddenly it's like the mud was peeled from my eyes and i thought oh my god because here's me in the middle of writing a book about wargaming campaigns and one of of course the big problems that you have as an umpire running campaigns with people who are maybe all over the planet you don't know and you want to enable certain key groups of players to be able to communicate with one another or not communicate with one another certain key players to be able to see stuff or not see stuff and suddenly i thought oh my god the potential of this for the you know what i'm writing about in the book potentially there's a whole new chapter i need to write (laughs) about this thing so nick please uh, you know, I'll, I'll calm down here because I've got quite excited about this. Please explain to our listeners what you've been doing with this Discord software. OK, uh, we started using it um, as a response to some work I was doing in the corporate world. So I was doing some decision making business wargaming in the corporate world. And I use matrix principles about, you know, tell us what you're doing and why. And that's really good for questioning the assumptions that they're making in the corporate world. Yeah. Uh, and one of the ways that I do that is because I'm fairly old school. It was on a piece <laughs> of paper. You know, I collect this because some of the stuff. So we run, we run a business ball game and I run it and I do it fairly low tech. So I run it in the same way that you would run a creed bill. We have, right. you know, we take the client to a venue. We have different rooms with different teams in different rooms. And the umpires run between the rooms like blue ass flies, uh, getting the instructions of what they're going to do and preparing. It's just like it's just like a, a proper creed bill, but, in, you know, it's a business topic that you're dealing with, yeah. taking a scenario into the future and, and then um, seeing what unfolds with teams taking on different roles, et cetera, et cetera. And, the feedback that uh, and, and the feedback is fantastic, but one thing the clients expect nowadays is it's a bit more high tech than running about with a bit of paper. Yeah. They want to be able to do things using technology. So I thought, bugger me, what am I going to do that's going to help us to do this using technology and with zero budget to develop it? Um, and so I sort of thought, well, let's ask the wargaming community, right? Because the wargaming community is doing war games. Yeah. So I put the question out there: Has anybody used any of these chat services for this? And it was Mike Hobbs who replied. And said, um, have a look at Discord. And there are other tools. There's a tool called Slack, and there's a tool called 
Discord and there's uh, there maybe some others as well. But yeah. I looked at I looked at Discord, and the reason I looked at Discord was uh, firstly because Mike suggested it, and I I know Mike and I trust him. Yeah. Uh, secondly, because it was cheap, and in fact, it's actually absolutely free to use. Uh, and thirdly, I had the time at that moment just to look at it. So those things came together. I looked at it. And um, so Creech Bills, as you know, we run lots of Creech Bills. I mean, Richard and I used to run Creech Bills with Paddy Griffiths, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so umpiring for him. So I love umpiring Creech Bills. There's something really special about that that um, way of gaming. So what I decided was, okay, let's test to see if this works. I'm going to use this Discord app to see if I can run a World War II cruise bill mm. using a one to 50,000 scale map of somewhere in Belgium. Yep. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to see if we can get two teams together, a red team and a blue team, yep. uh, and and, uh, and run a war game using this channel. So I set it up. Now, if you're going to run a cruise bill, there's certain physical things that you need to have. If you're going to run a proper cruise bill, imagine you're coming to my house for a weekend cruise bill, right? We, yeah. We've both been there in uh, various times. So what do I need? Well, first of all, I need a space where everybody can come together and I can say to them, hi, guys, we're all here to enjoy this cruise bill. Um, here's a cup of coffee. Here's a bun. Uh, have a good chat. And then we'll get down to the briefing. So we need a room where we can all be together. Yeah. Then we, and Then I need to say to you, Okay, you're the red team, you go into that room. You're the blue team, you go into that room. So I need to have three rooms now uh, if I'm going to do this properly. And I also need to have a room for the umpires to use, which might have stuff in it that teams can't see. Uh, But I also need to have potentially other sub rooms as well, because if somebody in the red team goes off on their own, then I need to separate that person from the rest of their team. And so I need to create rooms all the time. So if you can... If you can imagine that process being used online in chat rooms and that mm-hmm. same hierarchy, so you come into the chat room, into the top-level chat room, yeah. uh, and everybody has access to the top-level chat room. You, you join Discord, you get a membership tag or whatever. Yeah, you yeah. Have silly little username or whatever it is you have to create, you know, mm-hmm. what can I call myself this week? Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and so you set that up. People come into there and you say, okay, guys, here we all are. Now I'm going to allocate you into teams. So you allocate the people into teams, um, and so you can have a red team and a blue team, so you have a separate chat room for them. Yep. So now they can chat to each other in, yep. within their teams, yep. uh, but not, but they can't see what's going on in the red team room. Yep. But because I'm an umpire and my role, I set the role up, you can set a role up on the system, okay. the role of umpire can go into the red team room and the blue team room. Mm. Uh, and then you also set up a room called the map room. Now, in the map room, you put the map for the campaign, and everybody can go and look at that. But all they can do is look at it. Uh, yep. So they can go and look at the maps. And then they go back to their teams and make their plans. Yep. Um, and then, of course, if you have different players doing uh, different roles, you can have a green team or an orange team. Yep. You can have a red sub team. And you can control who can speak to who through the power of the umpire <clears throat> that right. allocate roles to people. Yep. So it's a, it's a way of replicating that Creekspeel way of working, but doing it online. Yep. Now, it sounds quite – I don't know if it sounds difficult or not. Um, you know, we've done two of these games now, yep. and they've been excellent in terms of the quality of the game that we've had. So what we tend to do is this. We tend to – the way that I've worked it is I'll put a shout-out on Twitter – Yep. Say, okay, guys, I'm looking for some lab rats to play this game online, and some people came forward. One of them, uh, Simon Tonkis, I think is a, is a, is a yep. chum of yours, yep. is on there, uh, and I'm guessing he's played Creechfield before because he's he's picked up the format very, very quickly, yep. um, and it's all about planning. So we say to the teams, okay, you guys give me a red team, you guys give me a blue team, here's the map, and here are your objectives. Yep. I'm going to leave you now to give you four or five days to plan what you're going to do. Yeah. And they could plan on the app. Now, the way the word app works is it's like a series of text messages. Yeah. So I would write something, I think we should defend the bridge at 412116. Yeah. And the next guy would say, I think we should not do that and do something else. And through that process of communicating by text, scrolling text message, yeah. the team can make decisions. Right. Um, I've learned a lot about the way we need to set up the team structures, by the way, since doing this, this oh, okay. process, which has been good. But um, And that generally is about clear roles and responsibilities, which, yep. is, which, is, which is easily fixed. Um, so what we've done is I've given them a – so normally I say to them, okay, here you go. You've got the um, – get everybody in the chat room on a Friday, give them the weekend to plan, 
and I say, right, so make your plans, communicate your plans to me, to the umpires, um, and you can tag people. So if you want a question, you write at Lardy Nick, uh, what time does it get dark? And I can give you that information because that will flash up on my, because I've got this app on my phone. So if I'm in John oh, Lewis okay. or you know, if, I, if I'm wherever I am in the pub or whatever, Matt, Matt Meshes comes up from the player, I can respond to it there and then. So if I don't have to be glued to my computer. Right. Um, and they have that conversation. They confirm their plans over the weekend. Yeah. And what we say is, make your plans. Make sure I've got your plans by uh, by sort of close of play on Sunday. Yeah. And then at um, 1,900 hours GMT, and that's important because we've got players internationally, <laughs> yeah. at, 19, at 1,900 GMT, everybody's online. And we're going to play the Creech Bill and unroll the scenario. Um, I'll, t- I'll give you the feedback on your first set of actions, yeah. and then you respond to that, and off it will go. And of course, as you know, once you set a Creech Bill off running, yeah, you don't quite know where it's going to go. Yeah. You do know that some people are going to be very actively engaged, and other people aren't. Yeah. Um, but what you get is a, a growing storyline of a game which builds and builds and builds. And of course, Creech Billing isn't about making it up as you go along. A lot of people think it is. But there's a, there's a set of procedures and, and practices that you follow as a cringe bill umpire. Yeah. Um, and we've designed some of those to suit World War Two because obviously cringe bill wasn't designed for World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. So things like rates of movement and what space does a you know, company take up, that kind yeah. of thing, we can work through. So you work through the game. Uh, people interact with the umpire by uh, messages. I tell them what's happened, uh, and they then make their decisions. The really interesting aspect of it, from my point of view, is – as an umpire, you give the information to the person who's experiencing that situation and you give that to them on their private channel because everybody has a potentially has a private channel. So you say your division is being, you know, badly beaten up or whatever. Um, and they then relay that up into their team chat room. So the team chat, if you can imagine, mm-hmm. becomes like the radio net of all the units mm-hmm. that are in action. Fantastic. And the feedback from some of the guys that have been trying to be the CNC is that there's too much noise on the radio net because everybody's telling them everything yeah, that's yeah, happened. Yeah. I'm being shot at from the woods. I'm being shot at from the woods. Yeah, so, and, the, and the poor guy who's in command is trying to read all these messages as they go up his and screen them, and yeah. also make decisions based yeah. on what he wants to do strategically. So um, I know that for the for the commanders is quite difficult. And, and do you know what? I personally love that. Because actually the, the, the ability to filter out the right information and communicate effectively is part of the learning that should be going on in the creature. Absolutely. Field. It's about yeah. marshalling resources and having clear communications. Yeah. And watching uh, – this is why umpiring creature bills is so enjoyable – because you get to see this go in both teams. Yeah, yeah. And as you also know with Creech Bills, you get two plans that come together, and what often happens is that you get to the point where there's going to be a conflict, an action is going to happen. And you can choose to either play that out, or you can just say, well, you know what, actually, you know, side, the red team is definitely, is, you know, there's no point in this, they're going to yeah. flatten them. Yeah. Um, so you can you can play that through whatever pace you want to, to get to wherever you want to get to, uh, and move the timeline forward, using whatever bounds you need to to make that happen. And it's been uh, super, really, really, really yeah, yeah. Knacker, knackering to run because as yeah. an umpire, you are in all the rooms going backwards and forwards. Like Constantly. It's live, t- live timing. It's live, live timing. So well, it's, yeah. you know, we, we, we're live streaming it. and it, So we start at seven. We do it for th- about three hours is what it's turned out to be. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've had, a, we've had a, a great game each time. Um, and we're, we're going to make some changes for the next time round. And part of that is that I'm going to be more controlling about what roles I give players. Right. So whereas in the past I've tended to say to them, you're the red team, you know, work out for yourself who's in yeah. charge, who's going to command what. I'm actually going to say, we're going to give them the structure. You know, you're the, you're the battalion commander, you're commanding A company, you're commanding B company, you're commanding C company. This is what you've got. So, this, so you're actually replicating the command net, which, which to be honest, I should have done from the start. I was just too... I was just too polite in letting people do their own thing, uh, you know, because they're coming together. They don't know they don't know each other. These guys, right? Yeah. Either so, some of them never met before. Yeah. So they're sussing each other out online at the of same course. time. Of course, yeah, yeah. But that's hindsight, and that's how these things kind of develop. But I, you know, just from what you've described there, I can tell. Oh my God, I need to do this for my campaigns. You know, this what do you need transform. to what, How about this then, Henry? Because we're we're planning another one. And uh, I did say that I'd do it before Christmas, but I don't know if that's going to be possible or not, uh, to get the guys together again, the lab rats together to do a campaign. Now, what I would suggest is that you join us for that, but you would join us as an observer. So you can 
just, fantastic. Yeah, you can just see what's going on and read what's happening and move between the rooms as you would if you're an observer in a normal creature field. How would that grab you? That sounds fantastic to me, mate. And it will get you an inclusion in the book. Ah, of course. <laughs> World fame at last. <laughs> yeah. Would that be the full frontal or just uh, headshot? And then uh, there's one other important thing I need to say about it yeah, as well, yeah. because we're doing all this using text messages. There is an option in this system, and I've not been brave enough to turn it on for players yet, yeah. but there is an option to have voice channels. Oh, so when, right, we ran, okay. when we ran the last one, Richard helped me do the umpiring, and we had a voice channel open. So he and I oh, were in separate locations, but we could speak to each other. Oh, you right. can you can let teams do that. So the red team and the blue team could have a voice channel. Now I haven't let them do that oh. um, because I'm I'm not sure yet about letting them go there for a cringe bill because I like the fact that they're dealing with it as a rolling. Uh, yeah, text. yeah, yeah. But with the for a campaign of the kind I normally run, the imaginations thing, where they, yeah. if say you had certain commanders come together for a conference, say you know yeah. uh, in 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 a in a posh palace somewhere in the middle of Prunkland, then <laughs> you you could allow them to then have a voice channel where they could actually discuss things amongst themselves before yeah. then writing down their plans and taking it from there. Yeah, you could absolutely you could. And the downside of the uh, if them doing it by writing is, of course, that you get the full dialogue exchange. The the, the upside is that um, you don't miss anything. Yeah, you know, if they're making a decision, they haven't made it if they haven't written it down. Yeah. Um, so I you know I don't know where that will go. I suspect in time, my my feeling is that uh, where they where they're allowed to, they can have that dialogue. So if you, if you're in the same tent as each other. You can have a dialogue. Yeah. But if you're 400 miles away in different regions, well, you can't have that dialogue. Absolutely. You need to have it a different way. Yeah, yeah. Mate. I think it will work well. I think you can you can flex the timeline for it so you can just have people chipping in when they want to. It's right like with all games, though, Henry. If somebody chooses to do nothing, there's not a lot you can do about it. Oh, and I'm so it's familiar. Just man manage the players in the same way as ever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of the questions I asked uh, answered in my three and a half hour Q&A, wasn't it? Uh, was it Pat G asked the question, what are the best things and worst things about running imaginations campaigns and that was one of the points i made is that you you will die for, uh, for the players who really get heavily involved and want to do lots of chatting and writing and orders and all this and that that's absolutely fantastic it's the ones who for whatever reason seem to have died or dropped dropped off the edge of a cliff yeah. uh, for no apparent reason that you think well why did they bother getting involved in this in the first place mate yeah, yeah. I, i'm i'm conscious of the time we're cl mm. getting close to the time when you're going to turn back into a pumpkin yeah we are we have a very tight curfew in Lard <laughs> island uh, yeah so so <laughs> My detective is telling me that Richard is within five miles, so we should, absolutely. I should get off the phone and put all the cutlery back before we go. <laughs> but, I mean, that has been incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Nick. That's brilliant and, and has really fired me up. And certainly, you know, if, if I can come along and observe one of these things when they're happening, I would absolutely love that. That brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm not sure yet how big a group it will handle either. We've done it with about 10, eight or 10 so far. Right. Don't know how big it could go. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing because I've seen some of the kids playing video game. One of the examples they gave, I'm fairly certain there was about 20 or 30 of these kids yakking away, which would be mind blowing as a thing to have to manage, of course. Uh, but anyway, um, so I would say we're kind of getting to the point of summing up now. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of mention before you head off, mate? Anything else you wanted to ask me? Apart no, what, are you doing, what are you doing for Christmas, Henry? Is this your last podcast for Christmas? Uh, oh, God, Christmas bar humbug. Um, I don't know is the answer to that. It might be the last podcast before Christmas. I might well do another blog post or something as a Christmas special for people. Goodness me. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that would be good. Yeah, uh, Christmas, in like Bieber's, Christmas cards from Bieber's foot in Punkland or something of that kind. Yeah, more so more sausages. Uh, my son tells me that Marks and Spencers are doing foot long sausages in bacon this Christmas. Oh Can you my that? God, that's outrageous. <laughs> uh, we've got we've got a German sort of uh, Christmas markety bit in the middle of Brighton where there's a sausage stand and he does really, really good bratwurst. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm a happy boy. Takes so it'd be good but it'd be good to catch up at some point, Henry. I mean we've got uh, we're going to be very busy on Lard Island. We're doing the Lard Annual at the moment, which will be out before Christmas. 
Uh, we're starting work on the Far East supplement for chain of command. Yep. We want to do a market garden supplement for chain of command. Uh, we're going to be doing um, probably next year chain of command two, which is going to be oh, pretty, right. pretty, pretty huge. I think if, uh, if we can make that happen, where lardy days are happening by the score. Yeah. Um, and I think we could easily spend, I don't know, half of the weekends a year just going to lardy game show. Yeah. So we're going to be a busy year. But as I said earlier, we have been fueled on the year we just had. Got loads of energy for next year. I want to do more of those Discord games as well. So let's let's get you in there. And if anybody else feels that they really want to be involved with that, maybe they can get a message to me. I'm on, I'm on Twitter at Dozy Bugger, D O Z I B U G G E R, uh, or I guess through you, Henry. They can. They yeah. can well, I'll put the link at the in the show notes at the bottom of the thing, so that they'll be able to find you. And of course, Rich and all the two fat lardies, multiple as many sites as I can dig up. But as you were saying earlier, you you can be hunting for something on the internet, and suddenly, hang on, there's a bloody lardy site somewhere in Papua New Guinea or whatever it happens to be, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> they just pop up all over the place. Well, people tell me that Facebook is uh, is, is powerful for, for, for all kinds of connections on yeah. the war gaming. So I think Facebook's Two Fat Lardies is on Facebook. Um, yeah. So by all means, messages on there. Yeah, war gaming pages on Facebook are have been the big thing of 2018. Actually, they've just mm -hmm. they've multiplied exponentially. It's unbelievable. Nick, mate, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been You're fantastic. Welcome. Well, really good to have a chin wag and talk about some, you know, relatively highbrow wargaming conceptual things there. Wow. Well, that's got to be good, hasn't it? I think we need to do a whole show on the Uda Loop, though. I think. Yeah, well, it's, it's doable. Uh, let's face it, I've done 10 years on it, so another <laughs> show would make no difference. <laughs> Dr. Nick Skinner, Uda Loop. Uh, fantastic. Thanks so much, mate. It's been really brilliant. And yeah, I'll have to get you on here again and perhaps with Rich next time uh, if, he's not, <laughs> if he's not driving somewhere and he's fully conscious. Brilliant. All right then, Nick. Thanks, okay. mate. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Cheers. Bye. -bye.